Hey, everybody. That was way too fast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to week nine of PS231. We're, we're now far enough in that I don't need to say, oh, we've been doing this for a while. We're more than halfway in, so you know that we've been doing this for a while. So in the previous lecture, we introduced the idea of extensive form games by way of a few fun examples. Ultimatum games, candidate entry games, pivotal politics, and so on. Uh, and I mentioned to you that these models are real workhorses throughout political science and other social sciences. Time plays a really important role in political processes. Expectations about the future play a really big role in political processes. Learning from the past plays a really big role in political processes. So this stylized version of time that we've introduced, this opportunity for some decisions to happen after observing some other choices thing, that's such an integral part to extensive form games, this is something that we're going to see very often. Now, we explicitly postponed analysis of these things. We explicitly said, I'm not quite sure how we're going to reason our way through these, what the, what the appropriate logic of analysis is for a game like this. Instead, we just focused on the way that time created these interesting substantive wrinkles that really enrich the fables that we've been telling up to this point. But just like Nash Equilibrium told us how to turn simultaneous move fables into predicted outcomes, so too do we need to find some device to take these extensive form models and turn them into some predictions. And we'll see that a lot of the logic from Nash Equilibrium will stay in place, um, but we're going to refine it to explicitly respect the role that time plays, the role of credibility, the role of expectations of the future. Because we have so many appealing stories already told just waiting for an ending, I don't see much use in us spending a lot of time trying to motivate things. I hope that you're just ready to see how some of these stories end. So let's just get right to it. In the A block, I actually want to start with something a little bit halfway through how you learn this sort of thing, but that applies the most to some of the games we've been talking about up to this point. I want to talk about backward induction. I want to talk about how we start the beginning of our prediction by going to the end of the story and working backwards. This is, when I say look down the tree, I'm going to mean something relatively specific by that. And it turns out that assuming rationality and the, the common knowledgeiness that everybody is rational and knows the game, we're going to take advantage of that in these extensive form models as well. Just the same way that we don't have to worry about strictly dominated rows or columns in simultaneous move games, so too do we not have to worry about paths in our tree that wouldn't be chosen. Now, we need to make sure that we explicitly account for the fact that these choices wouldn't be made. We're going to be thinking very hard about counterfactuals today. But the idea here is that we're just going to, you don't have to make a decision where you're worried about somebody choosing something that doesn't happen. In the B block, I want to extend, I want to enrich what we have about extensive form games by introducing information sets, which allow for some decisions not to be perfectly observed. These information sets are what allow us to come up with a appropriate definition of a subgame, which will play a big role in completing our method of analysis for games of this type. So backward induction can only take us so far. The backward induction algorithm is related to our notion of equilibrium in extensive form games, but not perfectly so. And in order for us to go from backward induction to subgame perfection, which is the target here, we need to have this intermediate B block, a little bit wonky, maybe maybe a little bit boring. I'll do everything by way of example, um, but it might be a little bit tricky all the same or a little bit flat all the same. And then the C block, I want to explicitly talk about subgame perfect equilibrium, which is related to backward induction, but is a little bit more respectful of the notion of Nash. So, so subgame perfect equilibrium is our real target here. We want to talk about backward induction, but we want to do so with an eye toward thinking about subgame perfection. Subgame perfect equilibrium and its associated logic is a real workhorse in political science. And it'll be useful for you to think about it now, but also when we get to the end of the class, when we talk about perfect Bayesian equilibrium, which is the current main workhorse notion of equilibrium in most applications of political science that you see. So today is a day of nitty gritty. We're gonna talk about how to turn these cool time respecting stories and take them and turn them into predictions. Um, and unfortunately, we're gonna have to be a little bit more analytical today than we were last time, but such is the nature of a class like this. However, I think that you'll see some interesting substantive puzzles emerge out of this analysis as well. 
and I hope that you're able to keep an eye on some of the cool politics at work while we act like analysts today. But no matter what, it's promises to be a pretty fun lecture. So let's get started. So here in the A block, I want to talk about backward induction, the backward induction algorithm that lets us know how to get our orientation for analyzing an extensive form game. I actually want to talk about this by way of example again, so let's load up candidate entry. So you'll remember here in candidate entry, uh, the initial mover is you, the challenger, and you can either not run for office, in which case we go to a status quo node, terminal node, or you can run for office. If you run for office, then the incumbent can either campaign as well or retire. So for now, let's say that the payoffs for the status quo outcome are zero for you and one for the incumbent. We'll say that the payoffs for the mud wrestling contest of a campaign are minus one for you and zero for the incumbent. And we'll say the payoffs for the world where you win because the candidate retired are one for you and minus one for the incumbent. So this is our full extensive form game, just like we do it last week. An interesting question is, what will happen? What do we think will happen? You can pause the video if you want to. Why don't you just pause the video and figure out which terminal node you think we're going to reach. Which of the three possible terminal nodes do you anticipate being the predicted outcome of this model? Pause the video. Write it down. Put it in a sealed envelope. So we study models like this, as you may have guessed from the name of the algorithm, by working backwards. What do I mean work backwards? What, what, what counts as a late decision? What's a late decision? What's one of the later? What, what are some of the last decisions made in a game like this? Well, notice that the challenger's choice doesn't only end with terminal nodes. So, so depending on their choice, it might go to a terminal node or it might go to a decision node. The, the incumbent's decision node. Whereas if the incumbent's decision, everything they choose ends in a terminal node. So that, that's an ending where the idea here is that no matter what the incumbent does, the game ends. So we're gonna look for decision nodes that are followed only by terminal nodes. Okay, that's, that's step one of this is figure out which are the, which are the last decisions. So in this case, there's only one last decision and it's controlled by the incumbent. So let's zoom in on them. So now that we are focusing on this last decision, this the final decision, which we know is final because it ends only in two terminal nodes, let's figure out what we think the incumbent would prefer to do here. They can campaign and get zero happiness points or they can retire and get minus one happiness points. So because zero is more than minus one, strictly so, the only reasonable thing to expect the incumbent to do if we get to this decision node, which is an if, that's an if, it depends on what the challenger does, right? But if we get to this node, we can reliably expect the incumbent to campaign. And I'll highlight, I'll just make that edge thicker so that you can see that that's our, that's our predicted, that's where we think that we go. If we got to this node, we think we'd keep going to the terminal node of a mud wrestling contest. So we're going to say that this decision node is now solved. This is now solved. It really isn't a decision node anymore. You might as well just put a payoff here because it's unreasonable. Once we're here, it's basically strict dominance, right? So the incumbent has only a de like a de degenerate decision to make. They know that the challenger ran and it's strictly better for them to campaign. So this, this decision node is now solved. And really what we want to do is try to find decision nodes where every node that follows it is solved and where terminal nodes are by definition solved. So, so the, the incumbent's decision was the last decision because it was followed only by terminal nodes, which we consider solved. 
Now we're considering the incumbent's decision node also solved because there we know that the incumbent will challenge. So we can just lop off the rest and say that decision, if, if the challenger runs for office, we expect the incumbent to run, which leads to the minus one zero outcome. So we'll just, we'll just move that payoff there. We'll pretend as if it was there to begin with. So now we look for another decision node that is followed only by solved nodes. Well, there's only one decision node left and it's followed by only solved nodes. So notice now that the challenger's decision is followed only by the terminal node of the status quo, which is solved by definition, and the incumbent's decision node, which we just solved. Now the challenger must make a choice. They can either not run for office and get zero happiness points, or they can run for office in expectation that the incumbent will run and they get minus one happiness points. Consequently, we anticipate that the challenger will not run for office. So I'll highlight that edge that goes from their decision node to the terminal node of the status quo. Now let me get the whole game back up here, along with the predicted outcomes. Notice, this is very important. So there's an equilibrium path of play. Remember, a path is just a line that goes from, it's just a tracing of edges, and it starts at the root node, the beginning of time, and it ends at a terminal node. So the equilibrium path, our predicted path, our backward induction surviving path, goes straight from the challenger's decision node to the status quo terminal node. However, the equilibrium of this game isn't just that. Because... The only reason that it's best for the challenger to not run is because they expect the incumbent to campaign. In other words, what happens off the path of play, what happens in the hypothetical world that we never get to see now, where the challenger challenges and the incumbent must make a decision, what we think would happen in that hypothetical is the thing that rendered not running best in the first place. So what happens up in this hypothetical world of a campaign decision influences what is best today for the challenger. Consequently, if I was thinking about a profile, if I was thinking about an equilibrium profile, I would want to know both that the challenger didn't run for office at their only decision node, and that the incumbent campaigned at their hypothetical decision node. Now, if I had written out, if I had written this game in matrix form, let me just zoom, there's the matrix form of this game. You'll notice that this game has a unique Nash equilibrium, which happens to be the profile that I just mentioned, where the challenger doesn't run for office and the incumbent campaigns. So in other words, our Nash prediction happens to coincide with our backward induction prediction, which explicitly incorporates time. So when we respect time, we actually don't change our prediction relative to what we would have in this particular example. That won't always be the case. Just to show you that, and to think about how the incentives at work really influence the decisions made today, let's tweak one and only one thing in this candidate entry game. Let's, let's change the model a little bit just to really highlight this. The one tweak that I wanna make is let's say that the incumbents payoff for retiring is one half, right? So they like it less than being in office unopposed, but they like it more than campaigning. They finally decided they'd rather retire than campaign. They just need to find just the right challenger. Let's see how that changes our backward, backward induction. So now notice that we need to find a decision node that's followed only by solved nodes. Because we haven't solved any decision nodes, the only solved nodes are terminal nodes. And consequently, that means that the last decision is again the, the incumbents. So we need to study the incumbents' choice. Let's zoom in on the incumbent. Now the incumbent can either campaign and get zero happiness points or retire and suddenly they get one half of a happiness point. They would rather retire now. So now that we've tweaked their preferences, we tweak the predicted choice here. So, so we switch from campaign to retire. So I'll fill in that retire edge and we'll consider this node solved. 
So that node has now been solved. Now the challenger has a very different decision to look down the tree toward, right? They can either not run and get zero happiness points, or they can run under the expectation that the, ch that the incumbent will retire and they get one happiness points. So they would rather run now. Now they want to run. They are no longer deterred. Nothing stopped them. Now they're, now they're actually enticed. They've been incentivized to try. So now we, we have the equilibrium path that goes from the challenger's decision node. They, they run for office and the incumbent retires. So run for office and retire is our new backward induction surviving profile. Now let me draw the, the strategic form version of this. Let me draw the matrix version of this game again. Notice, this version of the game has two pure strategy Nash equilibria. There's the one where the challenger runs and the incumbent retires. And there's the one that we had before where the challenger doesn't run and the incumbent campaigns. So there are two Nash equilibria and only one backward induction surviving profile, which happens to be a Nash equilibrium again. But what I want to highlight is, now that we've changed the incumbent's preferences, the reason that it's a Nash equilibrium for the challenger to stay out is that they expect, if we're not respecting time, they would expect it to be possible for the incumbent to campaign. However, once we introduce time, once we introduce credibility, once we introduce this expectation of the future, when the challenger looks down the tree, that's not a reasonable equilibrium anymore. That's not a reasonable equilibrium because it isn't a credible threat for the incumbent to, to campaign. We know that when, whenever the ball gets passed to them, they will choose to retire. So it's not credible. So that Nash equilibrium that we would get in this model in the strategic form version, in the matrix version, that equilibrium, once we really respect time by doing backward induction, is immediately ruled out. We're refining our notion of equilibrium. We're saying, okay, Nash equilibrium is a really good starting point, but it doesn't respect time. And because it doesn't respect time, there may be predictions that it makes that don't, that, that require incredible decisions, that require incredible threats to have bite. That's no good. That doesn't make any sense. So even though we had two pure strategy Nash equilibria, once we drew the game tree, once we, once we added a time structure, it turned out that they weren't both equally plausible. Only one of these predictions is plausible. And that's the one where the, where the challenger runs for office and the incumbent who cannot credibly threaten to run for office because whenever the ball gets passed to them, they retire, retires. That's what this is all about. It's about how what happens off the path of play influences what happens on the path of play. It's how expectations about what is a credible threat in the future influence whether or not you do the potentially risky thing now. Notice that we didn't change the, the challenger's payoffs at all. So that minus one, if the campaign happened, was just as bad as ever. It's not like we said, oh, well, campaigning isn't so bad for you. What we said instead was, you're not going to have to campaign because there's no reasonable way that you could expect the, the incumbent to campaign if they had the option to retire once we made that one tiny tweak. So this is the backward induction algorithm. That, and that algorithm is relatively straightforward. Call all terminal nodes solved. Find all decision nodes that are followed only by solved nodes. Solve them. Call them solved. Repeat the process until you get to the root node. And once you've done that, then you get this whole interrelated system of of edges that have been highlighted, an equilibrium path of play emerges, choices that are made off the path of play that complement the equilibrium path of play are made. Suddenly we have this whole pattern of hypotheticals and counterfactuals and one path of play that happens, one little Plinko chip that takes us. It starts on the root node and ends up at one of the terminal nodes. But where, those, where the little decisions were made, not by nature deciding whether or not the Plinko chip goes to the left or the right on any given nail, but rather because of credible and rational decisions made by every agent along the, along the path. That's what's happening here. It's, it's so small in this particular example that you can't see it, but, but that's what's going on.
Let's do another example in, in uh, let's do an, another simple, straightforward example. Let's do centipede. This is a big lesson to learn. So I'll draw that same version of centipede that we had before. You'll remember that in this game, there are two players, one and two. And potentially each of them can make two decisions. They can take or pass where we're sort of passing with this positive externality in mind, right? So, so every time we pass, the amount of stuff gets bigger and bigger. So the point where the two payoffs at the last decisions are two, four and three, three, that's a big, those are large relative to the, to the numbers that we had earlier in the game. The happiness points keep increasing as we keep going. Okay. So it's interesting to wonder, are we going to be able to get an equilibrium path of play that gets to one of those happy nodes at the end? Are we going to be able to see cooperation happen over time? All right. That's the big question here is, can they, do we, do we manage to cooperate long enough to get those better outcomes to happen through this passing of the externality? Notice that this game has four decision nodes and five terminal nodes, right? So there's the terminal node where player one just took to begin with. The terminal node where two took the first time they had a chance to. The terminal node where one took the second time they had a chance to. And then either the cooperative one where the where player two made a last pass or the, or the one where player two essentially defected at the end of time. Only the final decision node, only player two's second decision ends only in terminal nodes, ends only in solved nodes for now. The other three all have can either go to a terminal node or to a decision node. And since we haven't solved any decision nodes, we have to go to the one that ends only in terminal nodes. So let's start at the end with player two's second decision. So at player two's second decision, they can either take and get four happiness points or pass and get three. Well, they would rather take. So I will highlight that, I will highlight that, that edge that goes from the, from the final decision node for player two to that particular terminal node. We now consider this decision node solved, right? So, so this decision node is now solved. We can just put it, we can just put that two, four there. We can just move that. We can pretend like that wasn't really a choice. We can pretend like that was a terminal node itself. And now we go backwards. We find the next node that ends only in solved nodes. Well, player one's first node doesn't end only in solved nodes because player two's first node isn't solved. Player two's first node isn't solved because player one's second node doesn't, isn't solved. However, player one's second decision is now the last decision of what's left because it can either go to a terminal node if player one takes there or to a solved node if they pass. So now player one is at their second decision and they can either take right now and get three happiness points or pass on the understanding that player two will take at their final decision at that solved node and they get only two happiness points. Well, that means that they would rather take. They would rather take. They can get those three happiness points now. So that node is now solved. So player one second decision and player two second decision, those are both now solved decision nodes. Okay. We have we we feel like we know what would happen at either of those if we got to them. So let's go, let's go up a step. Let's go to player two's first decision which is the only current decision node that ends only in solved nodes. Well, player two could either take now and get two happiness points or pass on the understanding that player one will take at their second decision and player two will wind up with only one happiness point. So player, player two would rather take right now. They would rather take, they would rather take. So they'll let, let's highlight that edge. You might be starting to see where this is going. So now we have only a single decision node left to study, the root node, the very first decision, the beginning of time. We have made our trip from the end of time all the way to the beginning of time. Well, player one can either take now and get one happiness point, or they can pass on the understanding that player two will take at the first chance that they get. And they will wind, player one will wind up with zero happiness points. So player one would rather take now. So, in other words, we have a unique profile that survives backwards induction. And what happens? Well, at the first decision node controlled by player one, they take. At the second decision node controlled by player one, they take. As for player two, at their first decision node, they take. And at their second decision node, they take. So in other words, even though the pot keeps getting bigger as we keep passing, 
the temporal structure of this game precludes any benefits of that. Because every time you pass, you know that gives your, your opponent a chance to take, and they will. When you look down the tree, you see nasty things happening. So if you're player one, you'd just rather take your happiness point now and be done with it. The centipede game is a very sad story. If we continued this process for a hundred iterations, thus living up to the name centipede rather than quadrupede, you'd have the same outcome. You'd have the, no matter how long you extended this game, one iteration, two iterations, a hundred iterations, a Google iterations, a Google Plex iterations, with a Google dollars out there, a Google dollars is waiting for you if only you can keep passing. You'll never do it. You'll just take now. And if you're player two and you and you get a chance to make a decision, which right now isn't happening, you'll take you'll take the first chance you get. Everybody takes the first chance that they get. So this is a very sharp prediction. There is no ambiguity about what our prediction out what our what our predicted outcome is here. There's no ambiguity and it's nasty. We failed to cooperate. Notice that both the 2-4 and the 3-3 utility imputations that we get at those, those final terminal nodes, those both Pareto dominate what winds up happening. This is like the prisoner's dilemma, but with time. Right? It would be great if we could keep cooperating, but now instead of the constant threat of defection, there's this constant threat that somebody will just end the game without you getting a chance to respond. They'll just take all the, they'll take their share of the money and run, and you'll be caught. So in order to stop yourself from getting caught like that, you just take when you can. That's the reason that they took too, by the way. They took because they were scared of you taking the next chance that you had. So this mutual temporal distrust, that's the logic of the centipede game. So backward induction, it really takes seriously the idea that whenever a decision maker makes their decision, they choose what is best for them. And people that make a de decision prior to that decision act in anticipation of their rationality. So, so the challenger acts in anticipation of the incumbent's rational decisions. Here, player one acts in anticipation of player two's rational decisions and vice versa. That's, that's really the big powerful thing of backward induction is it says, well, whenever you have a chance to, to essentially end the game, right? If you have a choice over two terminal nodes or multiple terminal nodes, if you have a chance to be done with the game, Let's just see what you would choose there. But then why would we think that you would choose anything other than that? Well, conditional on that supposition, now I view your decision as solved and it's the same process repeated. And that's the induction. Is you just kind of keep repeating the process. That cascade of rationality starts at the end of the game and goes all the way to the beginning. So you can imagine that because of this sharp and negative uh, prediction in the centipede game, that it is, uh, this is this was a game that got taken to the lab pretty often. Um, so that started in the late 1970s, um, where they started to do experiments on students. It sounds like uh, they started to do experiments with students. How about that? Where they asked them to play the centipede game with each other, where there were some monetary incentives involved. This is what they do, right? So experimental social scientists take predictions like these and say, well, if I designed this game, if I, if I designed a laboratory experiment where this game was played by two players with monetary incentives that were meaningful enough to them that they, we think that they would act as rationally as they could, whatever that means, do they do what we would predict? I mean, it's hard to know. You don't know what you would do necessarily. But in the laboratory, it's not the case that this immediate defection thing happens. Sometimes there'll be a couple of rounds of passing the ball and then somebody will take once it gets big enough. Maybe there's a threshold. Maybe you have a threshold of money in your mind, past which you'll take, and short of which it isn't worth it to you to look like a jerk, right? So maybe you pass, and then it comes to me, and I don't want to look like a jerk, so I pass, and now, now there's more, and maybe it still isn't quite enough for you, so you still pass. You don't want to look like a jerk. It would still, you'd still look like too much of a jerk relative to how much money is in the pot now that we pass twice. But maybe I don't mind looking like a jerk so much. And you're like, oh, no, I'm quite sure that you don't mind looking like a jerk, Rob. Right? So maybe I don't mind looking like a jerk so much. So then I take. But because you know that I'm, I don't mind looking like a jerk, maybe that influences your jerk decisions whenever you have a chance. 
It was easy to be cavalier when you were turning down the winner's amount, but maybe the loser's amount is worse than your jerk cost would have been. And so you'd rather be a jerk today, not because you were planning on being a jerk moving forward, but because you thought that I was going to be a jerk next round. So you do see intermediate. It's pretty, you know, depending on how long the game is, it's pretty rare to get to the ending, ending, you know, where like this is like choose between these two amazing outcomes. But you usually don't see this stark of a prediction every time. This is the sort of thing, uh, you know, if we were live, I'd be able to try to come up with some inducements and see if you lived up to this. See if you, in our little personal laboratory of PS231, would we be able to, would you play like a, like a rational player here or would you deviate from backward induction? And oftentimes you do see a couple of rounds of, of passing and then finally somebody takes and then somebody's really mad. Like I thought we were cooperating. Now, if it's a couple of Skittles during class time, maybe you don't mind. But what if it's two countries? What if you were a leader that had to go back to your population? And they're like, why did you let that other country defect on us? And you're like, well, I didn't want to be a jerk. And I thought that maybe they'd be cooperative too. They'd throw you right out of office. You'd be done. You'd be done. Citizens do not mind jerk costs because they're not the ones paying them. On that subject, we'll do audience costs uh, on the problem set so that you can work through that logic and see how that A parameter really influences some of these decisions. It's a little bit tricky, but I'm confident that you'll be able to pull it off because it's, it's never more complicated than this. You might get lost, you might get into quagmire, but really just look for a decision node that's followed only by terminal nodes and, and start digging there. That's what you do. Okay, so in the B block, I want to talk about how to enrich these extensive form games in a way that will allow us to come up with the precise definitions of subgame perfection moving forward. And we'll do so by way of a cool example. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in the B block. So suppose that you were the ruler of a country called you land and you were deciding whether or not to be nasty to your people. So you're a sovereign ruler and not sure if you notice, but depending on where you are in time and space, some sovereign rulers do very nasty things to their populations, right? They might confiscate wealth. They might repress. They might quell out rebellions. They might extract rent. There's all sorts of nasty things that a sovereign ruler can do to her citizens. So I want to write down a model that allows this sovereign state, the sovereign ruler, to make a decision of whether to be nasty or not, to transgress the people's rights or not. And then I want to say, well, and whether or not that creates a problem for the sovereign depends on whether or not um, two factions of the populace can manage to coordinate on challenging the ruler. So the idea is like any one faction isn't enough to get rid of the ruler, but if two factions that are big enough coordinate on throwing the ruler out, then there's a successful coup d'etat and the ruler is out. The problem is the two factions in society are not going to be able to, to talk to one another. They just go out into the streets or they don't, right? It's not like they're going to be able to see each other's moves in advance. So they're doing something simultaneous, but only in response to something done sequentially by the sovereign. Okay, so this is a model of the rule of law. So here's how we write it down. At the beginning of time, you, the sovereign, can either transgress or not transgress the people's rights. That sounds heavy, right? It's better than centipede, where we're just like doing pirate gold. Regardless of whether you transgress or don't transgress, regardless, faction A in society has a choice to make. Faction A can either challenge you or acquiesce. Regardless, after faction A's decision, faction B faces a binary choice. They can either challenge you or acquiesce. 
And the idea here is that if they both challenge you, then you get thrown out of office and it's very bad for you. They don't want to challenge because fighting is costly. They would rather not be transgressed than transgressed. You would rather transgress than not transgress. They have stuff that you want. Okay. So you'll notice that there are eight terminal nodes in this game, right? And I'm just going to throw up some utility numbers for these. Let me tell you a substantive story first. The idea is that you being in office is worth two happiness points to you. If you could manage to successfully repress the people, you would go from two happiness points up to eight happiness points. If the people manage to stave you off, then they get eight happiness points apiece. And if they issue challenges, then they must pay a challenging cost of one happiness point. So just to give you an example, if you transgress and both uh, the faction A and faction B challenge, then you get zero happiness points because you got thrown out of office because they both challenge. They managed to successfully coordinate on challenging. And they get seven happiness points apiece. The eight that they had minus the challenging costs. This looks like a voting game, right? In the world where you transgressed, faction A challenged, and faction B acquiesced, then you get eight happiness points because you successfully repressed. Faction A gets one happiness point because they're they got, they got repressed and they challenged, so they paid a happiness point. And Faction B gets two happiness points because while things suck for them, at least they didn't try to challenge you. The same works to reverse one node down. That's transgress, acquiesce, challenge. So that goes eight, two, one. Finally, if you, tra if you transgress, if you transgress and they both acquiesce, then you get the eight happiness points and they get two happiness points apiece. So 0, 0, 077, 821, 812, 822. The idea here is they both, it's insufficient for any one faction to challenge you. It takes two factions to, to take you out. If you don't transgress, well, if, if faction A challenges and faction B challenges, then you still get thrown out of office. That's zero happiness points for you. And they get seven happiness points apiece because they have their eight from not being hit and they have to pay a, a, a one point cost for the challenges apiece. If you don't transgress, faction A challenges and faction B acquiesces, then you get two for still being in office. Faction A gets seven because they, they still have all their stuff but they paid a challenge cost. And faction B gets eight. The same works in reverse, one node down. You get two happiness points for staying in office because there wasn't a successful coup. Faction A gets eight happiness points because they they haven't been they haven't been repressed and they didn't pay a challenge cost. But faction B only gets seven because they paid a challenge cost. Finally, and maybe the happiest world of all, where there's no transgression and both acquiesce, then we wind up at two for you and eight apiece for the factions. So let's just analyze this via backward induction before we modify it just to show you what it would look like. Well, we need to find decision nodes that are followed only by solved nodes, which for now are just the terminal nodes. That's all of faction B's decisions. All, every single faction B decision goes to the end of time. So at the, at the top one, where there was transgression and faction A uh, challenged, then faction B can either challenge and get seven or acquiesce and get two. Well, they'd rather challenge, so we'll highlight that one. If the Sovereign transgressed and Faction A acquiesced, then Faction B would rather acquiesce as well because they're not going to get any, there's not going to be successful if they fight. They'd rather, they'd rather get the two than the one. So they would rather acquiesce at their second one down. In the world where you, the Sovereign transgressed and Faction A challenged, Faction B would still rather acquiesce because they get eight happiness points rather than seven. They have nothing to fight for. They haven't been repressed. And finally, in the world where the Sovereign transgresses and Faction B acquiesces, fa Faction A acquiesces, Faction B would still want to acquiesce. So at the top, at the very top decision node for Faction B, they would rather challenge, otherwise they acquiesce. Consider all of those decision nodes solved. So now we have two decisions to think through on Faction A's part. So suppose that the Sovereign transgresses. Now Faction A is thinking, well, I can challenge 
And if I challenge, I can reasonably expect faction B to challenge, and I would get seven. Or I can acquiesce, in which case I can reasonably expect faction B to also acquiesce, and I get two. Seven is better than two, so I would rather challenge. So at that top decision node for, for faction A, they would rather challenge. And in the world where you, the sovereign, did not transgress the rights of the people, faction A is thinking, well, I can challenge and rightfully expect faction B to acquiesce, and I get seven happiness points. Or I can acquiesce and rightfully expect faction B to acquiesce and I get eight happiness points. So I'd rather acquiesce. So in other words, at the top decision node, faction A challenges and at the bottom decision node, faction B, faction A acquiesces. That takes us to the beginning of time, the root node controlled by you, the sovereign. Well, if you transgress, you can reasonably expect faction A to challenge and faction B to challenge and you get zero happiness points. Or, if you don't transgress, you can rightfully expect faction A to acquiesce and faction B to acquiesce and you get two. So you would rather not challenge, you would rather not transgress, I should say, and so you don't. Now look at all the contingencies, seriously. Look at all the things that happen off the path. The only thing that happens on the path is we go not transgress, acquiesce, acquiesce. That's the equilibrium path of play. I'll change its color. That's the equilibrium path of play. But all these other predictions that happen off the path are what incentivize this being how the Plinko chip goes. Off the path of play, it would be possible for the Sovereign to get eight happiness points. However, none of the decisions made by the factions allow that to happen. And consequently, the Sovereign doesn't think it's worth it. They'd rather just not transgress in the first place because they don't expect to get any of those eights. There's no reasonable way for them to expect eights happening. So in this simple, straightforward model, we have a crisp prediction, no transgression, and we, we would expect to see peace. We would If we were just collecting data about this country and it was about transgression, we would say transgression didn't happen here. And if it was about possible coups, we would say that didn't happen. This is a completely peaceful, peaceful on the sovereign side, peaceful on the faction side, this is peaceful. In this version of the model, notice that Faction B gets to observe what Faction A did perfectly. They know for sure what Faction A did. They also know for sure what the Sovereign did. But in many contexts of potential coordination against the Sovereign, possible coups, possible civil wars, possible opposition, possible secession movements, in all of these, it is reasonable to say that that's actually a simultaneous move. That's actually a simultaneous move. Faction B might not get a chance to see Faction A, or there's no reason for we, the analysts, to say that we know which would be the first to move. We don't know which faction will be the first to respond. And so as analysts, it's an act of humility for us to say, we don't know whether A goes first or B goes first. We think it seems simultaneous. It's simultaneous from our perspective. The way that we model that is by saying, what if Faction B didn't know which decision node they were at, for sure? What if they only knew that they were within a subset of their possible decision nodes? For example, suppose that Faction B didn't know if they were at either the top or second down, they don't know essentially whether Faction A responded to transgression by acquiescing or challenging. They don't have information. They can't adequately discriminate. They didn't see. They don't get a chance to see in advance. That's what this, I'll highlight this with a little oval around these two decision nodes to say, faction B does not know which of these decision nodes they're at. They make only one choice there. They don't make two choices. They can't condition their choice. They can't condition their choice on what faction A did. They can only do one thing there. And similarly, we'll say they can only do one thing they don't get a chance to see what Faction A does in response to non-transgression. So what we've said is that Country B has two information sets. They don't really have four distinct decision nodes. They have two information sets, each of which includes two decision nodes. If I can use a word that might make you get a little itchy, we have partitioned player B, uh, Faction B's decision nodes into two information sets. 
the one where they the one for the transgression world and the one for the non-transgression world. When we do that, we're essentially saying that whoever moved before faction B, in this case faction A, is moving simultaneously with faction B. Faction B can't see what faction A did, and consequently, there's no reasonable reason to think that faction A will act in rational expectation of faction B at those nodes. They don't know where they are. So faction A is moving simultaneously as if with faction B. And faction B is acting simultaneously as if with faction A. So in other words, you can envision these as all, you can imagine two simultaneous move games. Just two matrix games here. Two coordination games. Can they manage to coordinate on challenging? I'll even highlight that by overlaying some matrices on top of that. Anytime you see an information set like this, it's you can just say, okay, that looks like there's a matrix thing happening there. There's a matrix thing happening there. All right? Now, whether or not our equilibrium prediction of this model survives, our richer system of analyzing is going to depend, but we're going to be studying in this style. We're actually going to be thinking about information sets too. We were thinking about information sets before, but in a vacuous way. Every decision node was a single valued information set. Everybody knew perfectly which decision node they were at. All that we're doing is saying, well, that doesn't, that ain't necessarily so. And so this richer set of possibilities adds some wrinkles in ways that'll be useful to us. You'll see it won't happen in the C block, but on the problem set, it'll happen. So now that we've gotten this far, we're all set up to talk about subgame perfection, which I've reserved for the C block. So let's go to the C block. So I just want to highlight two things about these information sets. There are two things that are true about information sets. One, within a given information set, all of the decision nodes must be controlled by the same player, right? So these are all faction B is in this information set or faction B is in this information set, okay? Otherwise, if you knew who you were, you'd be able to figure out which node you were at. Whether or not you know who you are is more of an existential question, but we're assuming that these folks aren't so existential all the time. And two, it has to be that the, the labels on the edges that come out of every node from a given decision, from a given information set, those have to be the same. So if, if faction B had had the option of, of challenge and acquiesce at one decision node and hearts and spades at another decision node, well, if they got up in the morning and they saw that their options were challenge or acquiesce, they would know which node they were at. And if they woke up in the morning and saw that their options were hearts and spades, they would know which node they were at. So it has to be the case that, that they can't infer which node they're at from anything. Otherwise, it wouldn't be confusing to them. So here, the, in order for them to really not know which node they're at, it has to be the case that they had the same options. Okay. So I want to introduce the concept of a subgame. Subgame is really the last little concept that we need to add in before we can get all the way to subgame perfection. I mean, I have to introduce what a subgame is. Perfection, obviously, is well outside of my purview. So a subgame, as you may have guessed, is part of a game. So what happens in a subgame is we pull out a little part of the game. So you can think about a subgame as a subset of all these nodes, okay? But a subgame has to follow certain rules. So it's a subset of these nodes that follow certain rules. Rule one, a subgame must end only in terminal nodes, okay? It's not like we can just pull out the first decision and then it goes to a couple decisions and then that's it. It has to end only in terminal nodes. And it can't rip apart informa information sets. That's the second rule. Rule two, you're not allowed to rip these information sets apart. And basically, subgame perfection is going to be what happens if we use the logic of backward induction, but instead of doing it on decision nodes, we do it on subgames. <laughs> 
Okay. So we're going to start at the end again. We're going to work backwards. But instead of just thinking about every given individual decision, which isn't a well-formed thought, once we have information sets that aren't just singletons, once we have interesting information sets, instead of doing that, we're just going to solve the whole game and then call that sub game solved. So let me just throw the rule of law game back up on the screen. Okay. And this includes the information sets. Notice again, faction B doesn't get to observe what faction A does. Faction A gets to observe what the sovereign does. So does faction B, but they don't get to observe each other. So it's interesting to ask, what are some sub games of this game? What are the subsets of the sets of nodes here that end only in terminal nodes and that don't break apart those information sets? So suppose, for example, that I decided to just highlight as a subgame the top decision made by faction B. So that ends only in terminal nodes. So it, it, it keeps that rule satisfied. But notice that to do that, we had to break apart an information set. Anytime I include this one decision node for faction B, I have to include the other one. All right. I can't break that apart. And rule three of the two rules that it has to satisfy is that it has to have a single root node. Any given sub game, you know, you can't have sort of an information set as the start of it. It has to start from a single decision node. So for example, if I just grabbed, if I just wanted to pull out this subset of nodes, faction B's decision node after transgress and challenge, and the associated terminal nodes, this is not a sub game. Why? Well, it is true that it ends only in terminal nodes, but it requires tearing this information set apart. I'm not allowed to just include one decision node from, from from faction B's information set here. Okay? So that isn't a sub game. Nor is it a sub game just to have the two just the information set. We need a we need a root node in any given sub game. So our first sub game of the rule of law game is the one where faction A is making its decision after observing transgression. That's a sub game. Okay. There's a second sub game in this model. And it's the game, it's the sub game where faction A makes a decision after observing non-transgression by the sovereign. And there's a final sub game. It's the sub game that's the whole game that begins from the root node of you, the sovereign, and ends only in terminal nodes, all eight of them. So this has three sub games. A, the one that starts from A's decision after transgression, the one that begins from A's decision after non-transgression, and the one that begins from your decision in the first place at the beginning of time. So then what we're going to do is we're going to look for subgames that are descendants of earlier subgames. So in, 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 in this example, we've got two descendant subgames, two proper subgames that they're called. The, the, the two that begin with, with, with player A, with faction A. We're going to quote unquote solve those. How are we going to solve them? Before solving was just a matter of choosing what was best in any given decision node. Now we're going to solve them by looking for their Nash equilibria. So we're going to solve the games, solve each sub game. That's a proper sub game of what's left. Consider that sub game solved write in the associated utility numbers and act like that was a terminal node the whole time and then move up a step until we get to the beginning of time. I'll show you what I mean. So first things first, let me convert these two sub games that we have into their strategic form variants. Zoom. Throughout, I'm still putting the sovereigns number first, even though they're not making choices in these sub in these bottom two sub games. I'll put the Sovereign's number first, and then Faction A's, and then Faction B's. So the, the transgression subgame has a matrix representation, and the non-transgression subgame has a matrix representation. 
Notice that the rows are controlled by faction A and the columns are controlled by faction B. So, the, you know, the first set of numbers there are only there to remind us that the sovereign is lurk lurking in the background thinking about transgressing. So I'll put in some best responses here. In the top subgame, if faction A is if faction A thinks that faction B will acquiesce, then they should acquiesce. And if faction A thinks that faction B will challenge, they should challenge. Similarly, if faction B thinks that faction A will acquiesce, they should acquiesce. And if faction B thinks that faction A will challenge, they should challenge. So this subgame, which is controlled only by factions A and B, has two pure strategy Nash equilibria. Acquiesce, acquiesce, and challenge, challenge. We'll consider that solved. We now consider this solved. We'll have to evaluate multiple contingencies because there are multiple Nash equilibria here. But this, now we have a reason to think that there are two stable outcomes in pure strategies in this subgame. The one where they both acquiesce and the one where they both challenge. Let's go down to the non-transgress subgame. Well, if faction A thinks that faction B will acquiesce, then they should acquiesce and take the full eight. And if faction A thinks that faction B will challenge, they should still acquiesce and take the full eight. If faction B thinks that faction A will acquiesce, then they should acquiesce and take the full eight. And if they think that if faction B thinks that faction A will challenge, they should still acquiesce and take the full eight. So notice that this subgame has only one Nash equilibrium, the one where they both acquiesce. Okay. Consider this subgame solved. So in other words, up here in the transgression subgame, one of two things can happen. The factions can either agree, they can coordinate on throwing the sovereign out, or they can agree to acquiesce. Down here in the non-transgression world, the only equilibrium prediction is for them to both acquiesce. I should note that if you wanted to, you could find the, the, the mixed equilibrium up here, but it's not going to be very enlightening. We'll focus mostly on pure strategies and extensive form games. Well, now an interesting question is, what should the sovereign do at the top of the total subgame? The subgame of the whole game? Well, it depends on which equilibrium they think is going to happen in the transgression subgame. In other words, if they expect acquiesce, acquiesce up here, then they have one of two options. If they're expecting, let's just suppose for now that they're expecting acquiesce, acquiesce up here. Then if they transgress, they'll get eight happiness points. And if they don't transgress, well, the only thing that happens down here is acquiesce, acquiesce, and they get two. So it's best for them. If they expect acquiesce, acquiesce up here, the best thing for them is to transgress. That's your first full-on, officially labeled, subgame perfect equilibrium. I'll show you how to write it down momentarily. It's going to take a while, but that's one. The one equilibrium story is the, acqui uh, the two factions acquiesce when transgressed and acquiesce when not transgressed, and thus the sovereign decides to transgress. However, it's just as plausible that it's just as Nash-like for both factions to challenge up in the transgression subgame. So let's suppose that was true. Suppose they were playing transgress, transgress up there. Well then, now the Sovereign is thinking, if I transgress, I will get thrown out of office and I will get zero happiness points. But if I don't transgress, they will both acquiesce and I will get two for staying in office. So there's another subgame perfect equilibrium. And the substantive story there is the factions manage to coordinate on throwing the sovereign out if transgressed upon. They both acquiesce if not transgressed upon and the sovereign decides not to transgress. So again, let me just show you those two equilibria on the tree. So here, here we are on the tree again. Here's one subgame perfect equilibrium and it's the, it's the all acquiesce one. Transgress, acquiesce, acquiesce. 
On the path of play, on the equilibrium path of play, we see that the sovereign transgresses, and then we see two acquiescings. I don't know how to say that. Acquiescences. Acquiesce. Oh, jeez. Off the path, we see mutual acquiescence in the in the non-transgression world. So that's one equilibrium. We'll call that the the orange equilibrium. The blue equilibrium is the challenge one. So now suppose that up in the transgression subgame, we see challenge ta challenge, and therefore the blue line coming out from the sovereign will go down to don't transgress, where we see mutual acquiescence again. So two different subgame perfect equilibria here. Or I haven't yet told you what a subgame perfect equilibrium is. But the substantive story there, you can see it really depends on the equilibrium selection of the coordination problem. Right? So just the same way that Bakker, Stravinsky, or Carr's coordination have a multiple equilibrium issue that fo that force us to figure out how to solve coordination. Well, if we can, if we know how to solve coordination, then that would teach these two factions how to coordinate on throwing the sovereign out if they needed to. They would get the 7-7 seven, seven rather than the 2-2. Two, two. So if they devise some social method to, to coordinate, then they will successfully deter the ruler from ever transgressing upon them. However, if they do not design a, a, a mechanism to choose the better coordinated equilibrium out of their two possible coordinated equilibria, which is to say, if acquiesce, acquiesce is just as likely as as challenge, challenge, even though 2-2 two, two is worse than 7-7. Seven, seven. If there's no way to coordinate, then the ruler will transgress. They will not be deterred. I mean, what does that if depend on? It depends on lots of things. What if they don't speak the same language? What if they're on different parts of the country? What if there's no roads between them? What if there's no lines of communication? These are the things that allow them to figure out what their contingency plans will be. That, that's a, it's easy to tell substantive stories about whether they manage to coordinate on throwing the sovereign out or not. And you'll see on the problem set that we can enrich the model a little bit to try to iron that wrinkle out. Substantively speaking, this model really highlights the importance of coordination in figuring out whether or not sovereign's powers are limited. Right? So, so a power is only as limited as the credibility of the threat if that power is, is exercised. So, so the limits of power arise endogenously here and depend quite a bit on whether or not there's an ability to choose the mutually beneficial coordinating equilibrium up here in the world where we've been transgressed upon. So that's, a, that's a cool point and worth expounding upon in future, in future weeks. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit low on time, and so I'd rather just tell you what a subgame perfect equilibrium is, and you'll see the backward induction in a game with no information set problems it gives you the exact same thing. So we say that an action profile, which is to say a selected action at every information set, a strategy is a map from information sets to selected actions, not from decision nodes, because you, you might not know which node you're at. So we say that a, a series of decision profiles where each decision is made in an information set, we say that that is a subgame perfect equilibrium if the associated actions are a Nash equilibrium of every subgame that you could draw. Which is to say, if the, if the game was really big, then it has to be true that in every smallest unit, which is to say every possible subgame, every smallest subgame, every little atom of strategy that ends only in terminal nodes, has its own little mini root node, and doesn't tear apart information sets, every one of those little atoms of strategy, we need Nash equilibrium all the way fine detailed like that, and we need Nash equilibrium in the whole subgame, in the whole game too. So what happens in small worlds has to reinforce what happens in big worlds. What happens in big worlds has to reinforce what happens in small worlds. All threats must be credible. 
So in other words, because, notice, because the whole game is a subgame, its Nash equilibria will emerge. You can do a matrix representation of it and get its Nash equilibria. So in other words, the set of subgame perfect equilibria will be a subset of the set of Nash equilibria. This refines Nash equilibrium by saying, it's not good enough to be Nash in the whole game. It also has to be Nash-like in the smaller versions where the threats actually have to be acted upon or where the promises actually have to be kept or whatever the case may be. Whatever happens late in the small versions of the game, the transgression small world, the non-transgression small world, what happens there has to be Nash-like too. Right? That's exactly what happened in candidate entry. In candidate entry, we had two Nash equilibria once we tweaked the utilities, but only one was subgame perfect. Okay? We reduced the set of Nash equilibria to the set of subgame perfect equilibria on the idea that subgame perfect equilibria respected time structures in a way that Nash equilibria didn't. If there are no information sets that link multiple decision nodes, then backward induction is precisely subgame perfection. Right? But as we continue to add more and more to the time structure, backward induction might not be a fully reliable workhorse. It's great in models like the ones we've been discussing, but it won't be quite flexible enough for what we need to do. Subgame perfection thought about properly like this, which most of the time is just backward induction. So most of the time backward induction, which is probably your instinct, will be more than enough most of the time. But some of the time, you'll need something a little bit more abstract and explicitly just subgamey, and we'll talk about that when we get to it in repeated games. But regardless, I hope that backward induction, subgame perfection, the thought that I want to be popping into your head is about credibility and about looking down the tree and expecting rational behavior, be it individual rational behavior like in backward induction or mutual rational behavior like in subgame perfection where we might have to look for equilibria rather than strict best choices by one player. Either way, when you make a decision, you're looking down the tree with reasonable expectations about rational play, be it individual level or aggregated. And what that does is it refines our set of predictions to those that respect time. That's pretty cool. And I, you might be in a little bit of a cold sweat here toward the end, but the modifications that we had to make to turn our Nash machine into our time respecting Nash machine are not that big, right? We're still at roughly the same logic that we were at before. It's just that we want to take time really seriously. And this is how you do it. So what do we talk about today? Well, you know, we, we kind of, last week we introduced time to our fables. We talked about how to tell stories that use time in interesting ways, that use time to create tensions, to establish trade-offs, to introduce interesting possible maybe risk-reward decisions where you make a choice and in the future something good might happen or something bad might happen. And those modifications to our stories really enriched the kind of political processes that we want to tell stories about. We suddenly went from things that were very simultaneous and we felt very constrained to situations that felt very more naturally political. However, we had not yet updated our analytical methods to respect time the same way that our fables did. And that's what we talked about today was, well, given that we have this new rich set of fables that include this interesting feature of time, how do we update our notion of collective rationality, which is what equilibrium is? One thing that's really interesting is that these analytic methods, which, you know, you would think that in introducing time might introduce a little bit more humility into the predictions. You might, you might think that we would suddenly not get super sharp predictions. But the centipede game that we discussed earlier today indicates that we're still going to be capable of making very stark and sharp predictions, kind of prisoner's dilemma-like predictions, crispy, sharp, unambiguous predictions that are also kind of negative 
don't necessarily seem to play out in laboratories or other settings with real flesh and bone human beings, and where the, the problems that emerge aren't because of just because of individual incentive structures, but also about how those individual incentive structures relate to our notion of time. So, so even though we introduced a lot more wrinkles, we can still get very sharp predictions that are counterintuitive and oftentimes empirically questionable. And it's with a thought like that in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. So think about the prisoner's dilemma. In the prisoner's dilemma, two suspects have been put in separate interrogation chambers. And because they're in separate interrogation chambers, their decisions are simultaneous. There's a Pareto improvement on the predicted outcome, right? So, so no matter how you slice it via IESDS or Nash equilibrium, the only predicted outcome from the prisoner's dilemma is for both of the suspects to defect on one another, which is sad because that leaves stuff on the table that would have emerged if they had they both cooperated. The three, three of the prisoner's dilemma is better for both parties than the two, two that happens in equilibrium. In the centipede game, the one zero that happens after the pl after player one takes in the very first round is Pareto dominated both by the two four and the three three that you see um, at the at the end of time terminal nodes. So an interesting question is which is the sadder story? They both have a similar flavor, right? We would like to cooperate, but we can't. Why can't we? Well, in The Prisoner's Dilemma, we have a classic canonical collective action problem where our individual incentives do not allow us to cooperate because of this strict dominance thing that happens. In Centipede, it's not a collective action the same way necessarily. It's more like there's a time inconsistency problem where it's impossible for you to, to think that you'll be able to move at a future time and consequently, that time inconsistency forces you to do something bad today. Now, in the laboratory, defect effect doesn't happen all the time in the prisoner's dilemma when it's been put in lab experiments. And similarly, take in the first round doesn't happen every time when, when we do the centipede game. So there are some naturally altruistic or egalitarian instincts, seemingly, at work for the people, the flesh and bone people that play these games in laboratories, which happens on a month to month basis across the world. So if you were going to try to design an institution to incentivize happier outcomes, you would have two options at your disposal. These are as old as time itself, carrots and sticks. You could either punish those that defect early, that defect at in the one time period of Prisoner's Dilemma or defect early in Centipede. Or you could try to offer bonuses to those that behave well by maybe making the 3-3 better in Prisoner's Dilemma or making the 4-2 and 3-3 better in Centipede. But the time and consistency in collective action problems would persist if you used only carrots. Right? No matter how good you made the outcomes at the end of Centipede or no matter how good you made the outcomes in Prisoner's Dilemma, so long as defecting was better, it would be impossible for us to carrot our way out of the problem. We need some sticks. So whom would you punish harder? The Prisoner's Dilemma defector or the centipede quick taker? Who committed the worst sin in your point of view? The person that had one moment and had to think through this strict dominance thing and realize that no matter what they did, their compatriot who was making a move at the same time was going to defect. Or the centipede quick taker who wishes that, that they could have a chance to make another decision, but that knows that their compatriot the next time period will defect on them essentially. Is one sin worse than the other? I'm calling these sins for provocative reasons, but you don't know. They're not, they're, they're maximizing their utility function. That doesn't necessarily make it a sin. I'm using that word loosely. I don't think either is worse necessarily. I think they're the same problem, but in two different languages. One is distrust that you think through in your head. And the other is distrust that you think through in your head. 
But in the first distrust, the distrust of prisoner's dilemma, you're thinking through in your head what you think your hypothetical compatriot is doing right now. It's not, and actually, it's actually not that hypothetical at all. In Centipede, however, it's completely hypothetical because you have the power to make sure that your other, that the other player never moves. So, in a sense, the Centipede selfish act is worse because it doesn't give player two a chance to be the bad person or to be a good person if something mutant happened. However, the institutional design problems at work for the two are very different. If I wanted to solve Prisoner's Dilemma, I would probably have to proceed by some mix of carrots and sticks. But with Centipede, I think I had to proceed only with sticks. Because we're never going to get to the end, because there's no reasonable way to say we're going to get to the end of the Centipede, carrots aren't the question. The question is, how do we make sure that people don't want to take early? All this to say, these sad stories that we tell all have similar flavors, but they emerge in different ways. And your understanding of which version of, the, of a similar problem you have should influence your views on what you think good solutions to those problems ought to be. Collective action problems and time inconsistency problems are two sides of a similar coin about just selfish bad play and how it plays out. But even though they have deep similarities at work, the differences are substantial, particularly when you thought about how you would try to fix them. The reason we write down games is to help us to see these problems before we suffer from them. And hopefully to try to design solutions to them before it's too late. So the more of these fables that you see, and the deeper your understanding about what our expected outcomes are from them, and of the discrepancies between real human play and rational robot play, the better the chance you have to be part of the solution yourself. And not only that, a good part of the solution too. A part of the solution that fully understands the problem as it is characterized in this particular instantiation, be it simultaneous or sequential. And when you think about it that way, then the decisions that a lawyer makes or a judge makes or a politician makes or an urban planner makes or a city manager makes, all the things that political scientists often go on to, political science majors often go on to do, all those decisions help to solve different versions of similar problems. And so if nothing else, I hope that you're taking this class hasn't just been some fish oil to try to make you a little bit stronger in general, but also helps you to see that whichever path of play you wind up on, you have a chance to be part of a solution if you can understand the problems. And seeing similarities between seemingly different problems is the reason we write down fables in the first place. I hope you're enjoying them. Thanks for watching.